Welcome back to the uh, Equine Anatomy Lectures. Uh, this is the fourth topic after we talked about the uh, head, neck, and uh, thorax. Uh, started talking about the equine abdomen. Uh, talked about why it's important to study this uh, subject and uh, provided some clinical cases to demonstrate that. And then we went and talked about a number of uh, muscles uh, that forms the abdominal wall and also the uh, abdominal tunic uh, which the deep fascia that that covers the uh, the, the muscles and it must be must be sutured today we will continue on this uh, uh, topic after we mentioned the different parts of the uh, gastrointestinal tract in the previous lecture So the outlines that I provided before, the significance, the abdominal wall, which you already finished, and then we talked about the abdominal topography and what are the uh, uh, different organs uh, in the abdominal cavity. And I mentioned that the majority of the abdominal cavity is basically uh, occupied by the gastrointestinal tract. And uh, mentioned the gastrointestinal tract started by the esophagus and then the stomach which uh, uh, resided on the uh, ventral midline slightly to the to the left and then comes after that uh, uh, the duodenum which was on the right hand side of the animal and then uh, it, it it turns at the level of the uh, base of the cecum to give you the large um, uh, or the long jejunum uh, uh, which is uh, uh, tied up with uh, with uh, an extremely wide uh, mesentery, and then uh, it ended up with uh, the very short ilium. Uh, and with that, we talked about this. The, the, this is the end of the small intestine. Now the large intestine started again on the right hand side of the animal, which uh, basically we saw the cecum on the right hand side. Uh, after that comes the um, uh, right ventral colon, uh, which uh, uh, bends. Uh, to the left and and becomes the uh, the uh, left ventral colon then it bends uh, on the same side and and, uh, and becomes the uh, the left dorsal colon and then it it turns at the level of the uh, sternal flexure a uh, diaphragmatic flexure uh, to become the uh, right dorsal colon then becomes the transverse and then the small colon and then the uh, uh, the rectum um I, I mentioned that we will talk about this uh, even more, but for now, uh, we will start talking about each of the structures and um, the um, the clinical relevance for each of the for each of the components of the gastrointestinal tract. And uh, we we mentioned that the first uh, part that we will talk about is is uh, the uh, stomach. So. In, in the equine stomach previously, I mentioned that um, first of all, uh, it'll be attached uh, to the to the esophagus, which, um, as I mentioned earlier in the neck uh, lecture, that um, it resides dorsal to the trachea, except in the first half of the neck or the first third. The cranial third or the cranial half of the neck, it deviates to the left hand side of the uh, trachea, and so you can see it when you introduce a nasogastric tube or when you introduce an endoscope into the esophagus. You can see it through the skin, and and that's very important for us when we when we do this procedure because. Or these procedures, because if we don't see it, that means the the, the endoscope or the uh, nasogastric tube is not actually in the uh, in the esophagus, and therefore you have to back it up and and, and redo the procedure. Now, when we introduce the the uh, nasogastric tube uh, or the endoscope all the way to the esophagus, right at this level, which is the level of the lower esophageal sphincter or the cardiac sphincter, we call it. We can see, first of all, that there is an acute angle that is formed between the stomach and between the esophagus. This is 
a very important uh, feature uh, with regards to the uh, relation between the stomach and the esophagus. And here, the level of this sphincter is about at the 11th intercostal space. And the way we need to do um, the procedure introducing the nasogastric tube or introducing the uh, endoscope is by, first of all, trying to stimulate a swallowing reflex, which will basically dilate the cardiac sphincter, or also known as the lower esophageal sphincter. Once this is open, you have to twist the tube or the endoscope a little so you can overcome this acute angle so you are in the a uh, um, in the in the middle of the um, of, of the stomach now there are some longer endoscopes that can actually reach to the to the uh, small small which it, to the duodenum not to the whole small intestine but to the upper portion of the duodenum if it's a three meter scope it can actually reach to the to the uh, duodenum and see if there's any duodenal ulcers there okay so so now we 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 also mentioned uh, before that the equine stomach consists of two parts two portions first is a non-glandular portion and a second is a glandular portion non-glandular portion and a glandular portion the two parts are separated but what we call margo plicatus margo plicatus now in addition to these features, we have also a third nerve plexus in the stomach. In GI physiology, gastrointestinal physiology, we learned that the enteric nervous system of the gastrointestinal tract consists of two ganglionated nerve plexuses a myenteric plexus sandwiched between the inner circular and the outer longitudinal muscle layers and a submucosal plexus located underneath the submucosa now in the stomach there is an aggregation of specialized cells of or neurons that can function as pacemakers. Pacemakers mean they are able to generate electrical activity and contractions on their own. So the stomach has this ability, has this ability. In addition to that, another structural characteristic in the stomach is that the whole gastrointestinal tract consists of two muscle layers, inner circular and outer longitudinal muscle layers. Inner circular and outer longitudinal muscle uh, uh, layer. In the stomach, you have a third muscle layer, which is an oblique muscle layer. An oblique muscle layer. The importance of the oblique muscle layer is that it the contraction of this a muscle layer will move the diff the different portions of the stomach in different directions so it's not back and forth back and forth it's going to also move it to the side and to the other side both laterally which will making the which will make the mixing uh, motility uh, uh, or ability of the stomach the mixing abilities of the stomach the mixing function of the stomach more uh, 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 efficient, if you will. Okay, so so we have the relation between the esophagus and the stomach, the acute angle at the eleventh intercostal space. We have to create a reflex, swallowing reflex, and we need to twist the the tube or the scope so we can introduce it. And then we have structurally, we have a pacemaker and we have an oblique. Uh, muscle uh, layer. Also, we have the pacemaker, and in addition to that, I've mentioned earlier in the uh, previous lectures that in racehorses, especially, you have um, gastric ulcers uh, uh, occurring 
pretty frequently almost 80 85 percent of these of these uh, 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 horses basically are affected with this uh, with this case I, I guess they're they're pretty competitive um, and so gastric ulcers is the most important uh, case uh, in in the stomach and you've seen pictures of uh, the uh, the uh, normal stomach before with the mygoplicatus and you will see also gastric ulcers in the uh, especially non glandular area uh, of the stomach and the the gastric ulcers are pretty pretty uh, pretty frequent in horses as the following graph will show this this graph this pie graph shows that um, uh, there's there is a lot this about 87 uh, percent we have um, uh, occurrence of, of gastric ulcers and we have about uh, 63 percent uh, colonic ulcers now combined together in 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 the at least in the cases that were tested in this study 54 percent were having combined cases of of, uh, of uh, both gastric and colonic ulcers but the majority is uh, basically um, uh, gastric ulcers this is just to show you the prevalence of the um, of the disease, not not, not to uh, but you you will get this in medicine and, uh, and 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 in more details about the pathophysiology of it and how we treat it and things like that. Um, another case um, that affects the equine stomach is uh, parasite infestation. Um, this is a this is a, a parasite that's called, called um, Gastrophilus intestinalis. Um, you can see this is the non-glandular region of the equine stomach. This is the glandular region of the equine stomach. This is the margoplicatus, the line separating between the non-glandular and the glandular mucosa. And on this line, you can see a bunch of, of um, gastrophilus intestinalis, gastric pots, basically. Uh, they're called, uh, that affect the um, um, horses, especially uh, those that are not well maintained and not, you know, well. Uh, they're not vaccinated and, and, and dewarmed and things like that, so they're ignored, if you will. But uh, but it, it happens all all the time, basically. So so this is this is one of the one of the cases uh, that affects the uh, the stomach. So so this is basically um, uh, the extent of our discussion on the on the stomach. Now we go to the small intestine. Okay, the small intestine consists of three portions, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. I mentioned this before. The duodenum has um, major and minor papillae for, for the bile and for the, uh, for the pancreatic secretions. And, uh, of course, horses don't have gallbladder, uh, so they have uh, secretions coming straight from the, from the liver uh, to, the, to the upper upper duodenum. And then you have the jejunum. The jejunum is pretty long in, in horses, and it, it's coiled, and it has an extremely wide mesentery. And, and, and this, is, this basically will cause a problem later on when I talk about colic. Uh, you will see that because of this wide mesentery, and because of these coils, and the length of, 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 of this, this part of the small intestine, which about 20 to 25, 28 meters sometimes, um, depending, of course, on the size, on the breed, on the species, and things like that, the the the, the jejunum have a tendency to 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 twist on its own, and sometimes to to tear the the mesentery, and and part of the jejunum goes into that tear and gets entrapped, and and sometimes it gets entrapped in in, uh, in some openings in the um, in the in the uh, uh, in the gastrointestinal tract and in the body, which I will talk about that later when I talk about colic. But 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 the jejunum is is a is a is problematic because because of this uh, of, of its length it's very long uh, coils and it's smooth doesn't have any any bands or any saculations and um, smaller in diameter and also it has a very wide mesentery which 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 will make it uh, pretty hard to to move easily basically the ilium is pretty short and pretty contracted pretty short and pretty number about ten, ten centimeters and it's contracted. Now, what I will do is I'll talk about each of these um, uh, structures uh, separately. Um, so, so we'll start with the duodenum. Okay, the duodenum is seen in this uh, view, which is the right-hand side of the abdominal uh, uh, cavity. 
This is the duodenum, the very first part of the small intestines on the right hand side of the abdominal cavity, and it turns at the level of the base of the cecum. At the base of the cecum, it turns to become the jejunum. Now, rectally, the duodenum cannot be palpated. Rectally, the duodenum cannot be palpated, except, except in cases of anterior enteritis. Anterior enteritis is basically inflammation of the duodenum, which causes thickening of the duodenal mucosa. This is an ultrasound image of the duodenum in an anterior enteritis case, and the thickness, the usual thickness is about three to five millimeter. The usual thickness in the normal, in the normal duodenum. In the case of anterior enteritis, it becomes about seven or eight, and sometimes even more, uh, millimeter. Uh, so the wall of the, uh, the, the duodenum becomes pretty thick, and it becomes pretty, uh, pretty, uh, palpable, uh, rectally. Now, now another another thing that that happens with this with this thickening in the duodenum is the fact that you have a lot of a lot of uh, edema we call it or accumulation of of fluids underneath the skin in this case uh, severe diarrhea and an abdominal edema uh, that looks like this. This is a case of of abdominal edema. This is sacrotal edema and this is abdominal edema as 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 sh shown in this. In this picture here now now please don't confuse this abdominal edema with the heave line which appears like this and um, and of course you you know that the heave line is basically goes more dorsally because it's the connection between the muscle part and the tendon part of the external abdominal oblique this is one thing that that's distinguishable from the vent the, the ventral edema or the abdominal edema and in anterior enteritis cases, the other thing is basically the age of the horse. In in heaves, we remember that uh, I've said that it comes or or affects older horses with heaves with 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 COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. In in the ventral edema case, it doesn't have any any age preferences. In the heaves, it does. It's pretty skinny uh, and 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 uh, emaciated um, horses that are pretty old. Pretty old and affected respiratory uh, 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 problems. Um, with the ventral edema, it is not uh, uh, the case. So, so the, these are, must be distinguished when when you have a, a, a um, you know a uh, a case history uh, uh, presented to you like this. Okay, with the jejunum, we have a number of cases herniation as i mentioned earlier again because of its two because the the length of the jejunum is pretty long um uh, tens of meters and also the mes mesentery is pretty wide it have ha has a tendency either to tear and the intestine will dive through that tear of the mesentery and of course you have the peristaltic movement that 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 gets it there and also you have bulbulous cases which basically a um, um, twisting of of of, uh, of the um, of the jejunum around its longitudinal axis. Once once the jejunum twists, it blocks the blood supply to the to the to the area that it, that is uh, supplied by this artery, the main supply for the gastrointestinal tract is the cranial mesentric artery, and this is a branch of the cranial mesentric artery. So if the if the jejunum twists or the mesentery twists on on its longitudinal axis that means you block this artery arterial supply for this piece of the intestine of the jejunum that means this piece is going to become dead it's going to become dead it's going to become pretty dark compared to the other pieces which up you know proximal to the to the twist which will be which will be pretty a, a pink so so these are the two cases that occur the the the, the ilium is not a um, because it's short and contracted it's not it's, it's not in, in general it's not a, a major major problem so now this is the end of the of the small intestines now 
we go to the large intestine. So, so you have seen this this picture before, and this is this is just a reminder. Uh, the large intestine starts with the cecum, a comma-shaped structure that resides on the right-hand side of the abdominal cavity. After the cecum comes the right ventral colon, right ventral colon. The right ventral colon turns at the level of the sternal flexure. It turns into the left ventral colon, the left ventral colon. The left ventral colon does not turn, but it bends on its own. It bends. So it does not change direction from left to right or right to left. Instead, it only bends on itself to become, instead of the left ventral colon, it becomes the left dorsal colon. Left dorsal colon. Now, at the level of the diaphragmatic flexure, it turns, it changes direction from left to right to become the right dorsal colon. And at the right dorsal colon, you have the transverse colon, and then you have the small colon, and then you have finally the rectum. Now, there's a very important characteristics of the large intestines in the horse, and these must be remembered. Two things, saculation and tinea formation. Saculation and tinea formation. Based on the number of these bands or the tinea, that's how we're going to know which part of the large intestine we are working with. So the cecum has four bands. The right ventral colon has four bands. The left ventral colon has four bands. The left dorsal colon has no, has one band, but no saculation. The rest are saculated. The right dorsal colon has three bands. The transverse colon is, has two bands and also no saculation. And the small colon has two bands. If you remember the number 4441322, this will make it easier for you. 444, 1 and 3 equals 4, and 2 and 2 equals 4. So 4441322. Four, 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 two, two. That's how maybe you you will memorize it easier. Now, we'll, we'll talk about these even, even more when we talk about the different parts of the gastrointestinal tract. But uh, we will continue on the large intestines now, general aspects. The general aspect that I want to talk about is the blood supply of the gastrointestinal tract. It comes from the cranial mesentric artery, which is one of the very large branches of the aorta. The cranial mesentric artery supplies the gastrointestinal tract in the horse, both the small and large intestine now. I would like to mention to you that sometimes, sometimes parasites infest the cranial mesentric artery. They block it. These parasites are from the strongulus, strongulus vulgaris, 
Strongylus equinus and Strongylus edentatus. These three parasites can grab into the inside wall of the cranial mesenteric artery and they can block it. Now, when you block this artery, blood cannot pass easily to irrigate the intestine. So the intestine starts to die. In addition to that, because of the pulse coming from the aorta is pretty hard, you can feel rectally pounding pulse in the cranial mesenteric artery at the level of the base of the cecum. So, from a clinical standpoint, the cranial mesenteric artery is rectally palpable, is rectally palpable at the base of the cecum. And it can be infested with three strongulus parasites, strongulus equinus, Strongulus edentatus and Strongulus vulgaris. All three parasites can infest it, can affect it, can block it, and when you block it, you will feel pounding pulse at the level of the base of the cecum again. Now, I will turn into talking about one of the most common diseases in equine and that is colic and when I talk about colic I will mention from an anatomical standpoint all of the important anatomical structures that will affect the gastrointestinal tract or the associated structures with it so we can basically understand them and understand their clinical relevance better. So next time I will start on colic. The second most frequent disease in equine after lameness. A very devastating disease. Until next time.